Hello, my name is Thorsten Hoeffler, and I wanted to make some argument related to high performance interconnects, specifically chiplet interconnects that we developed together with my brilliant PhD student Patrick If here, and he's going to give a more complete talk later on this channel as well. So, what I believe it's all about proximity, specifically in high performance networking that are mostly HPC and AI use cases today, it really matters where your proximity is, how far you have to go. And you can actually go multiple distances, or you have to go multiple different distances, ranging from millimeters on the very left to hundreds of meters, actually even thousands of kilometers if you think about interdata center connectivity. So at the millimeter scale, what you have is you have typically connections that are on the same chip, on the same chiplet. So these are called network on chip, and they're not um, part of this talk today, but very, very similar principles are actually used at the next level, which is called multi-chiplet or in-package interconnect, or sometimes also chiplet interconnect. So these are at the centimeter scale. So we have chiplets that are uh, centimeters of size, and then they are usually put pretty tightly together on a package, and these interconnects, they can span a couple of millimeters up to a couple of centimeters. And then the next level is actually the rack scale interconnect, very often called scale up interconnect, which is also something I will be talking about later. That's more in the context of ultra ethernet, so also not in this talk. And then the largest scale is somewhat the global scale, the global either data center scale, but even planetary scale, which is called the scale out interconnect, where as we mentioned, we go to from 100, um, hundreds of meters up to tens of thousands of kilometers, depending on really what we are talking about. But I want to zoom in a little bit in the smaller interconnect world, as I mentioned before. So the question is now, why are chiplets important? And I believe most of us know this. I just wanted to quickly recap this because chiplet architectures are probably the future due to many, many, many uh, advantages. For example, they usually uh, lead to improved yield and cost efficiency because of that. You can use heterogeneous integration. You can make chiplets um, for I.O. in a slower process or in a, in a um, less expensive process, and you can make chiplets for high-performance compute units or accelerators in a more expensive process, and then you can put them together in the same package, and you can benefit from both higher yield and uh, improved cost this way. It also enables modularity and flexibility in some sense that you can have different vendors delivering different chiplets to you that you integrate. For example, co-packaged optics chiplets are a very good idea to put together with compute chiplets or even I.O. chiplets that I mentioned before. And then when you manufacture those chiplets, you can actually frequency and power bin them that you can make high performance pieces and lower performance pieces integrated into a package. So you can now have a finer granularity of selection for the power binning. So the question is now, once you have that many chiplets, how do we actually put them together? How do we connect them together to a large system, to a large unpackaged network in some sense? And what I really wanted to mention here is it depends on the packaging technology, which actually mandates the, the distance you can, uh, you can uh, traverse. So now let me talk a little bit about packaging technologies. So here we list four different packaging technologies. So we have the organic substrate technology, the glass substrate technology. They're quite similar in some sense. So you put the, the chiplets on top of these uh, substrates. Well, that's pretty much the same for all of these uh, substrates. But then you also have passive silicon and active silicon interposer technologies. So typically the ones on the left are cheaper technologies and typically the ones on the right are getting more expensive, but that really depends on your manufacturer and on, on the exact details of your process. But the nice thing is that the passive silicon interposer can go a little bit wider and the active silicon interposer can then actually have an, an active layer of uh, uh, transceivers or repeaters on the chip itself. So which really means that the link length is mandated by this. So on these organic sub substrates, the link length is up to 1.5 uh, centimeters on, on both of those, glass and organic. Um, the um, uh, passive silicon interposer is a little bit smaller just because we are typically running higher frequencies on those. And then actually the active uh, silicon interposer enables us to repeat the signal. So we can essentially go arbitrarily along, well, depending on the size of your, uh, of your chiplet or of your package actually, it could be even wafer scale to some extent if we keep repeating the signal. Of course, then the latency goes up, but that is uh, in the realm of possible. So let me now focus a little bit on the middle term here, the passive silicon interposer, which has the tightest distance constraint to some extent here on, uh, out of the technologies on our slide. So what do we do with this? Well, actually, typically what we do today is we would connect those triplets in a two-dimensional mesh shape. So we take square chiplets that are, uh, that are produced by a standard laser cutting process. We would 
we would put them onto a square grid and then connect them to all their neighbors. Well, this has two problems. The first problem is that actually these triplets at the, at the boundary, which you, can, um, which you can see here, no, actually you can't see <laughs> the triplets at the boundary, they would not be connected to other triplets. So it's a mesh, it's not a torus. So you could connect them, but not in that particular configuration because the distance would be too long to connect the top right to the, connect, uh, to the top left, for example. The other disadvantage is that, as we will see in a minute, they're not optimally connected. So in the sense, the diameter of the resulting network is higher than it needs to be because every single chiplet ha has at most four different neighbors. Now the question is, how do we actually increase the maximum number of neighbors per chiplet? Well, remember, we are in a two-dimensional surface. And now the question is, what is the maximum number of neighbors we can get for regular tiling of any shape of a two-dimensional surface? Many of you uh, may know this, and, and I can let you think about this for about a minute, but the answer is relatively simple. The answer is actually a honeycomb pattern. So if you look at the honeycomb pattern, that is the ideal tiling of a two-dimensional shape without gaps to have as many neighbors as possible. So in this case, there are six neighbors, and you can prove that this is the maximum number of neighbors that is possible with such a tiling out of identical objects. And you can find the proof in the, the archive paper down there, which has also been published um, at, at DAC. So now, based on this idea, based on this motivation, we came up with this idea of hexa mesh. So it is not a hexagonal uh, pattern. It's not hexagons like you would have in the, in, in the honeycomb, but because they would be hard to produce. But we take the same idea and we take the standard two-dimensional chips, the, the standard rectangular two-dimensional chips, and actually we arrange them in a brick wall pattern where you slightly shift each of these two-dimensional chiplets. And you see overall you're actually going to produce something that resembles a hexagon. But by doing this, by doing this, uh, implementing this brick wall pattern, you get a maximum of eight, uh, sorry, a maximum of six neighbors for uh, the, the inner chiplets. Right? So that is something that is quite nice. We can now look at what does this actually give us in practice. Well, in practice, you get a, an improvement in the latency of about 22% if you're talking about uh, 100 chiplets compared to the standard 2D mesh. And you get also an improvement in bandwidth, which is um, nearly two times higher compared to the two-dimensional mesh. Here it depends really on the, on the uh, exact layout and the topology that you have. But now, this is quite exciting. So by just slightly differently arranging these chiplets, we can enable more neighbors, so six instead of four, increase the throughput and lower the latency. That is great. So that's the first trick I wanted to mention. But now imagine we give you a little bit more of a distance, like the one on the left. We have the organic substrate or the glass substrate, which can go a factor of three further. But again, this really depends on the exact technology details. But you can go further on these substrates, typically. What can we do there? Well, if you can go slightly further, you can actually fold the networks. And one of the key ideas here is to use an idea that comes from a 2D mesh architecture, which leads to a 2D fold, which could construct a 2D folded torus. Here we are spanning two chiplets with one link. So if there are less than 15 millimeters, this is perfectly possible in the configuration I just mentioned. And this way we can actually implement a logical torus network on the physical 2D substrate. So if you follow the, uh, the image on the right here, you will see that, um, that it is a torus in all dimensions and the only difference to the left side is, the distance difference is that we have to basically bridge one chiplet. So that is quite nice. So we can use the same idea to apply it to the hexa mesh architecture or to the hexa mesh topology and build a folded hexa torus out of it. So this way we get a, a six dimensional object, or actually it's, it's more like a three dimensional logical object where we have, um, where we are spanning at most one chiplet in each dimension. And we can build a very, very similar structure that also improves performance now, of course, because we don't have these, these missing links from the top right to the top left, uh, as, as in, the, in the 2D mesh or the hexa mesh uh, configuration. So this is now the second trick. So we can build a hexa mesh network, but we can also fold it into a hexa torus network with very similar ideas as the 2D folded torus. So great. So what does that mean for um, throughput? Well, this is a bit more complicated here. We have a much more elaborate e evaluation, and I let you look uh, through this yourself. But you basically see that the folded hexasaurus is dominating many other topologies, or nearly all of the other topologies in this diagram. And this is both on organic substrate as well as on glass substrate in terms of both uh, average packet latency as well as uh, total throughput. 
So this is quite nice. And if you're, uh, if you're interested in all the details, you could look through this paper. You could also listen to uh, the talk of my student, Patrick If, who has actually uh, two talks, one on the uh, Hexa Mesh and another one on the folded Hexa Torus online on our YouTube channel. So now the third question is, how do we now explore this design space if you wanted to really build these chiplets in practice? And this is quite complicated because you need a whole tool chain. You need to look at traces, you need to actually span a whole design space exploration because, as I mentioned, it depends on all of the uh, details of the technology. We can use our rapid chiplet uh, core tool chain to actually combine those, the, the traces, the design space uh, exploration into a framework that enables us to run cycle accurate simulations based on the book sim code and then even visualize the results. So if you have some specific workload in NetTrace Traces and you have some specific setup you wanted to go, you could actually use that rapid chiplet tool chain to design your chiplet layout. Cycle accurate with the help of BookSim. And this really features cost and performance proxies, so there are many, many things we could look through. We could uh, run directly through the BookSim simulator and then, as I mentioned, also somewhat automated design space exploration and the in, uh, for all the input parameters and many, many features that you could come up with. So with that, I would like to conclude my key points. First, I want to thank my student, Patrick If, who has been driving all of that work. And I wanted to repeat that it's all about the distance. Here in this talk, I just talked about the chiplet distance, so, so the intra-packet intra distance, which is only centimeters, but you can extend that argument going to whole data center scale. I talked about hexamesh, I talked about the folded hexatorus ideas, and then I produced um, kind of the major insights uh, into the tool chain that Patrick developed and that will help us, or will also help you, to build better chiplets in the future. Thank you very much, and see you later.